Cool, thanks for the introduction. So uh, as it was said, I'm currently working with Elixir at Club Collect. So if you want to work full time with Elixir, uh, especially if you want to work remotely, then uh, you can contact us. I also like Elm programming language very much. And really, I'm all functional languages uh, enthusiast. And this is because functional languages allow me to solve problems in more simple manner and it allows solving the problems I have uh, much quicker. In my career, there were times where I was giving uh, workshops on Elixir, and I've seen that learning new things, especially something like functional, uh, functional programming languages, a new paradigm, is not a smooth experience. It's more like a staircase where you have to grasp one concept really well before you can go to the next one. So when I was studying the resources, I saw that there are, of course, many great resources about syntax, about pattern matching and pin operator, which are uh, quite simple to grasp. But later on, sometimes people just forget that they can use it. Uh, then there are many great resources about basic recursion, like map, reduce, tail recursion. And it is because it's sometimes hard to grasp. However, when you finally get it, it becomes your second nature. And there are many great resources about concurrency, about distributed systems, because in Elixir there's the OTP, gen servers, supervisors, and it's, it's really, really great. However, there is some link missing between knowing the syntax and learning distributed systems. So I asked on Twitter, what would be your advice for people who are just starting to learn Elixir? And the first piece of advice was learn Erlang first. So I was a little baffled because I see that Elixir is an improvement over Erlang and uh, it also gives you this nice Rubyish syntax, which is one less thing to learn. And people were generally uh, more inclined to learn Elixir than Erlang. However, the answer was that uh, Elixir with its syntactic sugars sometimes covers stuff that is important and even though I partly agree with that, I see that those same syntactic sugars sometimes allow a development of new patterns in Elixir, and this is what I'll be talking about today. So the next piece of advice was write a book. So of course, it's a really good advice, and Twitter with its 140 characters is the best place to have constructive discussion. However, uh, this advice is really nice because people wait too long with writing anything. And if you're trying to uh, understand Elixir and you grasped a concept, just write a blog post about it. Don't wait until you become an expert because at that time you've already forgot how did you get there. And I think that Elixir community really needs uh, uh, good writing about basics too. Another piece of advice, so your application should be akin to an ant colony. Single ants are stupid and disposable. Fear not processes. Chances are you don't have enough of them. Learn the Erlang process semantics. Abstractly study parallelism like multi-core, multi-processor, hardware, OS process execution, and then match up with Elixir Erlang concepts. So this all goes to this concurrency and distributed system advice. Then if you're already a programmer, cons are a powerful tool. Learn to solve many types of small problems very quickly in order to solve bigger problems. And this is, of course, general learning advice, like start small and grow bigger. Learn to love reading the source. This is really good advice because Erlang and Elixir are usually very easy to follow. And especially if you're coming from C with its if devs for different hardware platforms and CPUs, Erlang and Elixir source is really nice to follow and it's a good way to learn, just, just reading the source. Get used to with else feature, so this is syntactic advice. And the most important thing today, don't write Ruby in Elixir. And this is like, like really, really important because people come from completely different paradigm and they want to apply what they know from Ruby in Elixir and it usually doesn't end well. So, at best, they start asking on Stack Overflow, how do I instantiate my module? 
And the answer is you don't because module is not a class. But at worst, they may actually be completely discouraged from learning functional programming, which really makes programming more easy. So today I'm going to talk about design patterns that will accelerate your learning, but I would like you to ask questions during presentation. So if there is anything you don't understand, just raise your hand, someone will come with a mic, or you can just shout the question to me and I'll repeat it to the mic, because I will start with very basic examples and end up with something more complex, just to show that the same design patterns can be applied in really many situations. Okay, so the two patterns I want to talk about today is firstly, use single data structure that is your source of truth and many small functions operating on it. And the second pattern is separate pure and impure parts of your code. But before I can jump to patterns, I have to ask you, is there anyone here who doesn't know what the pipe operator does in Elixir? Okay, there are no hands in the air, so I can skip next slides. Okay, so who knows what pipe operator in Elixir does? Okay, everyone, cool. So I can, I can switch it. So the good thing about pipe operator is that uh, when you have a data structure like list and you want to perform a couple of operations one after the other, like first you get the list, then you want to filter some elements, and then you want to sort the output. Uh, instead of creating three separate statements, you can just use the pipe operator. So you say that the sorted list is a list where you first applied the filter function and then the sort function. And because it is a macro, it's equivalent to something like this, which is much less readable because we start with something in, uh, in the middle here and then we read it backward, like take a list and then filter it and then sort it. So this is a really nice pattern. But what is more important for uh, the presentation and for other patterns is that you can basically take this code, those three lines of code, and make it into a function. So instead now of uh, assigning into a variable, I'm creating a function that takes a list as a first argument and returns a list. And this can be used in a pipe chain in the same way as functions from the enum module. So we have another function, two smallest events, which takes the function that we defined previously, sorted events, and takes only the first two. So this is still not a rocket science, but the basic idea is that we have a data structure, we transform it in some way, and it returns the same type of data structure. And this list transformation can be actually built of many smaller list transformations. And this is used throughout many libraries in Elixir. Another nice thing about uh, piping things is that you can use basic IO inspect for like debugging if you're learning uh, the language. Because IO inspect not only prints the data structure that we use, but it also returns it unmodified. So it doesn't modify how the pipe chain works. Okay, are there any questions so far? Cool. I anticipated that. <laughs> so uh, now we are going to first real world problem, which is data validation. So when we are trying to validate some data, we have firstly uh, the original data, like for example, we take a user from the database. Second thing is that we want to change something in this user, like in this case, we want to change the age from 29 to 30. And we want to uh, answer the question, is the data valid now? And if not, why? So in Elixir, this problem is solved by Ecto chain set library. And we can see that we have a single data structure, again, a little bit like in the list, but it has some fields that are clearly an input, like the data is the original user we have, params is what we want to change, so this age uh, to 30. There are fields that are more like output, so the valid uh, boolean says if the change set is valid at the end. Errors says uh, the list of errors if the change set is invalid. And there are also fields that are somewhat intermediate, like changes. 
So changes computes the changes that were uh, OK so far. And this can be useful during validation, but it's not actually our final answer. So how do we use this library? Firstly, we take our user from the database and we use cast function on it. So this takes user as a first argument, then uh, parameters that we want to change, and list of fields that we were going to validate. And we can see that this cast function returns change set. And from now on, everything that we do will take change set as a first argument and return change set. So we have first validator. It checks if we have all the required fields, and it returns a change set. Next thing is a validate format, which takes an email, checks if there is add in it. Of course, it's not the best way to check if this is actually an email and it is valid. However, you get the example. OK, so what if the Ecto library doesn't provide us with the validator that we need and we want to implement something ourselves? So let's say we have an event like today's conference. It has a start date and end date. And we want to make sure that the start date is not after the end date. Otherwise, we're involved in time travel. And the only programming language that does that is Python with from future import. <laughs> Elixir doesn't support that yet. OK, so we need to create a function that takes change set as a first argument and returns change set. The other two arguments are just the names of fields with uh, dates. So first thing, we extract those two dates that we're interested in. So we use the getField function for that. And uh, the getField function does actually two things for us. So firstly, it looks for the value in params in case we wanted to change it. But in case it didn't change, it looks for the value in original data. Now that we have those two dates, we can just compare them. And there are two cases. Either the start date is greater than uh, the end date. This is the GT case. Or in all other cases, everything is fine. So if everything is fine with this particular, uh, in this particular validator, we just return the change set unmodified. And what does it mean? It means that if in previous validators there were any errors, they will be still there. If everything was OK so far, it will be still OK. But in case the start date is actually greater than the end date, we use add error function. And the add error function, again, does a couple things for us. Firstly, it changes valid to false. Of course, if it was already invalid, then it does nothing with it. Uh, appends new error to list of errors. And what is really important here, it also takes change set as a first argument and returns change set. So if we look again at this function, there are two types of functions operating on change sets. The blue one, uh, get filled, extracts data from change set. So it, it returns uh, something else, uh, which means this is something like a getter or a lens. And there are the green functions that take change set and return change set, which means they can be used uh, in pipe chains. But also, validators can be composed in the same way as list transformations. So in case we, have, uh, we want to have some more complicated validation that actually performs many smaller validations, we can easily do it. Because we can just write a function that takes the change set, then applies those two validators, and it also returns change set. So the same way a set of list transformations is a list transformation, set of validators is also a validator. Another cool thing about change set is that it is also used uh, with the database abstraction repo. So if we want to insert something to the database and the database throws any errors, we can also convert it to change set errors. So we have the same abstraction both for, both for validation and for uh, database access. And bonus thing, it works for any data structure. So we don't need to use it with databases. We can also use it with uh, our APIs to, to check if the data from the API is valid. So we have three main benefits of using this kind of abstraction. It's easy to compose, because we can just pipe another uh, validator. It's easy to extend. In case we need something custom, we just create a function. And it's easy to test, 
because it only takes a data structure and returns a data structure. It does nothing with external state. OK, this is first of the three digressions between examples. And this is about immutability. Because people often ask, OK, if you create a new chain set each time with these small functions, does it mean that uh, in the bottom, in the Erlang VM, are we copying the data? And the answer is that if you have a language with immutability, uh, like uh, Elixir, uh, we don't have to do it uh, each time. So the example is that some data structures, like lists, are just linked lists inside uh, Erlang VM. So first element points to second, second points to third, and third points to null, indicating that the list ended. In case we want to modify the list, for example, prepend an element, we don't have to copy entire list. We just create this element, and it points to original list. And we can do that because we are guaranteed that no one will change this list underneath us. So when we create another list, it does the same thing. Yes? I have a question. What about if you want to delete an element from the middle of an array? Exactly. This is a great question. And if you want to delete element, then some part of the list can stay in place. So we can point to the end of the list. However, the beginning of the list has to be recreated. So it's a trade-off. Somehow, some operations are much longer. So for example, if you want to append at the end, then you have to copy entire list. However, some operations are much easier. OK, so in case of change set, we shouldn't worry that we're creating the data structure uh, slightly modified again and again, because it, it's handled nicely inside the VM. OK, this is a second example of the same pattern, which is ectomultai. So ectomultai is used for grouping operations on database, for example, so that we can run it in a single transaction. How do we do that? We create a data structure called multi with multi new. And this time, I won't show you the fields because the data structure is actually opaque, and we shouldn't know what's inside. And then we have many smaller functions, like update, insert, and delete, that take multi as a first argument and return new multi slightly modified. In this example, which is taken from Ecto Docs, we are trying to update user account. So we first update actual user in the database. Then we insert a log about it, for example, if we want to do event sourcing. And then at the end, we delete all the user sessions because for example, he might have changed his password. So then we can pass all of this to the repo transaction. And in green, there is something that looks like a table name, but actually it's not a table name, it's a tag that we as developers use uh, for writing the code. And I will show in two slides why it is important. Ecto multis can be chained in exactly the same way as lists and validations. So in case you want to have a function that performs a couple of multi operations, you just write a function that takes multi as a first argument and returns multi. So again, we have this recursive pattern where set of operations is itself a bigger operation. But this also means that we can create uh, something more complex in those functions. So for example, uh, we can check if something is valid and in one case, add this operation to the multi, and in some other cases, we can skip it. So this means that when, it, uh, when we want to test it, we would have to actually perform those operations to check uh, what is the actual output. So this would be really bad, because accessing the database is expensive during the tests. And uh, the problem is because uh, the Accessing the database is just an impure operation. And it is solved in Ecto, in Ecto Multi, by two list function. So at the end, when we want to test our multis, even though they can have many uh, operations in pipe chain, we can just use the to list function, and it returns all the operations that it would like to perform on the database with the tags that we specified at the beginning. So we can test our logic separately from our storage. 
And this is an example of the second pattern, separating pure and impure parts of your code. So multi is just a data structure. It, is, uh, it encodes what we would like to perform on the database, but we don't do it in the code uh, directly. So we have the same benefits. Uh, multis are easy to compose, just pipe another operation. They're easy to extend because you can just write a function. And there's also multi-run, which can do uh, many different things to the database. And it's easy to test with multi-to-list. OK, so now we have a second digression. And it's about garbage collector in uh, Erlang VM. And garbage collection is run separately for all processes in uh, Erlang VM. This means that if one process is undertaking garbage collection, then all other processes don't even know about that. So there's nothing like stop the world because I'm now collecting garbage. This is insane. And the second thing is that when process dies, all its memory is freed at once. So we don't have to perform a garbage collector, garbage collecting. This is very nice in cases where we create a new process per small request and it doesn't do uh, much processing. So for example, a web server is a good example of such thing. We just spawn a new process per request. It does its job, and its memory is freed completely. So it means that we spend much less time on garbage collection. Uh, of course, everything is a trade-off. So in this case, uh, the trade-off is that if we want to communicate between two processes, and we know that they don't share memory, this has to involve copying. So that, that's the trade-off. And I'm talking about web servers because my third example is plug. And plug is what really makes Phoenix great. This is the core library of Phoenix. So plug is a specification for composable modules between web applications. And at first, when I read that, I have no idea what does it mean. But actually, it means that it follows exactly the same pattern as chain set and multi. So we have a data structure called PlugCon that takes everything that we want to know about uh, web requests at any point in time. And we can also see that it has fields that we can say that are input fields, like host, method, get or post, uh, path info, request headers. It also has fields that are clearly output, like response body, status 244. And uh, it also has stuff that is intermediate, like parameters. So for each request, we can have parameters. And in Elixir, in the controller code, we would like to have it nicely as a map of key and value. However, they can come in many different shapes. So for get request, they may come in URL. For post request, it may come in body. So we need to first parse it. And actually, at the end, we're not that interested uh, in their value. So this is an intermediate thing. And you probably are not surprised now that a plug is just a function that takes con as a first argument and returns con. So the pattern is, again, the same. This, this plug does nothing. It just returns the con unmodified. However, the difference is that when we create a pipeline from plugs, we can't just directly use the pipe operator. There's a pipeline macro for that, where we specify the pipeline name and then list all the plugs. So the pattern is almost the same. A set of plugs or a pipeline is just a plug itself. It takes connection and returns connection. However, a plug and con data structure has this field called halted. And this is because we would like to be able to stop processing of the request in any point in time. So actually, what this uh, what this pipeline does for us, pipeline macro does for us, is that it always checks if the connection is not halted. If it is, then it returns the connection unmodified. Otherwise, it uh, invokes the next plug. So this is like a pseudocode for that. If the connection is not halted, uh, then run the plug. Otherwise, uh, return the connection. So what is cool about this pattern is that Entire Phoenix framework is nothing else than just a pipeline. And we have in this pipeline our endpoint, 
our user pipelines, router, and controllers. And our controllers are just plugs because they take con and return con. And each action in the controller is also a plug. It takes con and returns con. And what makes Phoenix so powerful is that we can apply our custom plugs at any point in the request lifecycle. We just have to specify where, and we can really modify how Phoenix works in any way. Here is a piece of code taken from Programming Phoenix. And this piece of code gets a user ID from session in a plug, and then wants to take this user from the database, and then assign this user to the con data structure so that we can use it later. Uh, I won't get into details of this code apart from the line on red, because the red line is taking something from database, and it makes the plug less testable, because we would have to have the database enabled every time we want to test this thing. So there is a clever trick for that, which sometimes is called explicit contract. So instead of using repo module directly, we're changing it to a variable. So the only thing that changed in the line is that we changed the repo from capital R to smaller case R. And this means that we are now using variable instead of a static module name. And this variable uh, in the beginning called uh, lowercase repo will have the default value of the module uppercase repo. So this means that in our production code, nothing changes. If we use the current user plug with just one argument, it will behave exactly the same as before this modification. However, if we want to test that plug, we can provide it with something else that doesn't touch the database. So we can create our own module like fake repo that for each get request, if it uh, has the ID of one, it will always return the same user account. And this way, we can make the current user plug more testable. OK, so here are the benefits of plug. Again, it's composable because set of plugs is just a plug. Uh, it's easy to extend. Your own plugs can be put anywhere in the request lifecycle. And it's easy to test as long as you ensure that you have explicit contracts and you don't mess up too much with external state. OK, so my third and last digression today is about naming. So this pattern has, or similar pattern, has a name in statically, functional, in statically typed functional languages. And I want you to guess the pattern. And my first tip is burritos, because there's a famous tutorial about this pattern, which uses burritos as an example. Anyone know the name? OK. The next tip is this. This is a bind operator in Haskell. Monad, exactly. This is Monad. So my next tip was maybe and IO, because these are famous Monads from Haskell. And of course, the definition of Monad is simple. It's just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Well, what not to get here? However, yeah, of course, I don't understand this either. I'm, uh, I'm not that versatile in category theory. However, a monad for me is uh, a pattern where you have a piece of computation, you have a way to compose it, and when you compose two, piece, two pieces of computations, they will have the same type. So it's the case with change set, with multi, and with plug. The bind operator in Haskell specifies the way to compose those computations. So in case of change set and multi, it would be just the pipe operator. However, in case of plug, it is more complicated because of this if not halted shenanigans. So the bind operator would be the way that pipeline macro uh, composes this stuff. Of course, if there is someone who programs in statically typed languages, he's probably pulling his hair out of his head because this is not exactly a monad, and I don't believe it satisfies all monad laws. However, it gives you the same nice things about how you can uh, write your code. Cool, my fourth example today is GenServer. 
And Jared server is a little bit different. However, it also uses those two patterns uh, I want to discuss with you. So a gen server is just a process, uh, a single process, where you have many callers and they want something from the gen server. So there are two ways to communicate with gen server. You can either call it, and in that case, there is a response, or you can cast something to it, and this is completely asynchronous, and you don't want to, and you don't want any answer. And how do you implement gen servers? Is that uh, you implement handle call callback, and we can see that the handle call callback takes a message, checks from who the message was, and entire state of gen server in a single variable. So we can see that we, we again have all the state in one variable. And at the end, we just want to return the reply. Uh, this is a tag, then actual reply, and then a new state. So this means that in case we want to test a gen server, we don't even have to start it because we can just fake the state, we can test the handle call in isolation, and we, we can check what's the new state of a gen server after those modifications. And it also means that if we want to test the server uh, with a couple of messages, one after the other, we can always take the new state and just put it uh, in, the, in the next call. So this has almost the same benefits. I'm not covering composing gen servers. However, they're easy to extend. You just add another message and uh, another handle call statement. And it's easy to test because yeah, you, you don't even have to start it. Uh, you can uh, get away with it without any, uh, yeah, without any external impure operations. And the last example is not about Elixir at all. It's about Elm because I said I like Elm. And I want, you to show you, I want to show you that the same principles apply in many places, in many functional languages. So Elm is a language uh, made for browsers to create frontends. And creating frontends is something that seems very difficult for a functional programming language because in the, its definition is that you react to stuff from the outside world, which is impure, and you modify the document object model, which is impure. So to solve that problem, Elm has an approach where your program has four main, uh, four main uh, components. Firstly, you have a model that incorporates entire state uh, of your application. Secondly, you have a set of messages to which you can react. Thirdly, you have an update function that takes a message, takes a model, and returns completely new model. And the fourth part is the view function that takes a model and returns virtual DOM. And why this is nice? So when we convert uh, the inputs from user to messages, we can have completely pure update function. So this function does no side effects. It just takes a message, takes a model, and returns new model, so something that changed in your application. When you have this new model, you pass it to the view function, which is also pure. It doesn't modify the DOM. It produces completely new virtual DOM. And then you pass it to the browser with Elm, which takes the old virtual DOM, new virtual DOM, compares them, and then applies minimal set of modifications to the actual document object model. So the same way as in GenServer uh, abstracted the impure parts of sending and receiving messages, the browser with Elm abstracts uh, modifying the DOM for you. And this is the same way React.js works. And another cool thing is that if you want to perform something else than modifying the DOM that is impure, like for example, Ajax call, you also do it using commands. So this is the same way Ecto library treated uh, uh, the, its output of multi. So you have a data structure that you can check in your tests if it does the right thing. And this data structure is then passed to browser with Elm. And after you have that Ajax call, the return value is nothing else than just a message that is later put to the update function. So the benefits are exactly the same. It's easy to compose because you can compose those components recursively. They all always have those four components. 
It's easy to extend. You just add another message that you want to handle. And in that case, compiler even yells at you that if, if you added a message and you didn't uh, update your update function, then it will yell at you that there are some cases that are not handled. And it's very easy to test because there are only pure functions. OK, so this was my last example. And again, the benefits are always the same. And these are the benefits of functional programming languages. And still, when teaching people, I see that sometimes people struggle uh, to see those benefits. And this is usually because they want to apply the knowledge they have from other programming languages, like Ruby, directly in Elixir. And this always reminds me of a comic uh, where two guys are talking, and one of them says, you know that carrots are good for your eyesight? And the second one does this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so every programming language is just a tool. And to get the benefits, you have to really know how to use it and really know what patterns are important in this programming language. So in case of Elixir, those two basic patterns are single source of truth, which manifests in chainset library, in ecto library, in multi, uh, in plug con, in gen server state, because there's always one variable, and in other languages like in Elm with model. And the second principle is to separate pure and impure parts of your code. So if you can separate the core logic, it's much easier to test. And testability is always good if you run anything in production. And make impure parts as a function inputs in case uh, it's really uh, not possible to, to separate it in uh, any other way. OK, so that's all I wanted to say. If you have any questions, uh, we can take them now. And if you like this talk, follow me on Twitter. Thank you.